Right. So we begin today chapter 4 of the Bhagavad Gita. The different chapters have been given different names by the various commentators of the Gita. Like I mentioned, the Gita is an organic conversation, a natural conversation. It is not that when Krishna is speaking the Gita, he says, okay, Ataha Chaturdasho Adhyayaha. Now I am making the 14th chapter. Now I am making the 4th chapter. Chaturto Adhyay, not like that. It is a natural conversation that is going on. And based on what themes have been uh, discerned, the author, that is Vyasadev, he divided into chapters. And based, based on thematic division, uh, the chapters were made by Vyasadev. Now, the original rendition of the Mahabharata, there are no chapters right there. There are so many chapters, hundreds of chapters are there. Sometimes the chapter are there, sometimes they are not there. But when the Acharyas write commentaries, at that time, based on how they are analyzing, they give particular names to the chapters. So, if we look at the chapters, the for chapter 1 has two broad names. One, it is based on the two sections of the chapter. One is observing the battlefield. That is, in Sanskrit, Sainya Nirikshana Yoga. Nirikshana is observing. Or, it is, the other name is Arjuna's Lamentation. Arjuna Vishada Yoga. Now, each of these is considered to be yoga, means it is, a, it is ultimately meant to help us establish a connection with the Divine. Now, chapter 2, is generally called as either what Prabhupada called as Sa Gita, Sa, contents of the Gita summarized or it is called as Sankhya Yoga. Sankhya is basically the analysis of reality into its components. So that is primarily matter and spirit. Krishna differentiates between the body and the soul. Chapter 3 generally has one name only that is Karma Yoga. <coughs> now Krishna talks about Karma Yoga in chapter 3 and then when we move to chapter 4 now, Prabhupada calls this as do you remember? Transcendental, Transcendental knowledge. knowledge good so Transcendental Knowledge now the, the previous Acharyas they have different names one of the names is Jnana Karma Sanyasa Yoga a little bombastic name. <laughs> Jnana Karma Sanyasa Yoga. That means broadly the Jnana that enables us to do karma with a mood of sannyas. So sannyas is renunciation. So the next chapter will be the, the Prabhupada calls it as Karma Yoga Action in Krishna Consciousness. And it is, it is called as simply Karma Sanyasa Yoga. So broadly speaking, if you see, the common elements in all these chapters is Karma Yoga. So the, the concept of Karma Yoga is introduced. The Jnana that enables us to do Karma Yoga is introduced or is emphasized. And then how Karma involves Sanyas. Karma also involves renunciation. Yesterday we discussed action. Acting and renouncing as two different categories. But Krishna is going to show how these two categories can actually be integrated. So that will be elaborated in chapter 5. Now in chapter 4, Krishna begins by moving from, in one sense, when a discussion is going on or an explanation is going on. For any person to choose rightly, the whole the Gita is all about basically right action. Now, for right action, two factors are required: the individual intention. The individual needs to be responsible, and the individual should be wanting to act rightly. 
and then there is also the social orientation if some say for example in society in say a country should run smoothly then individuals should not be corrupt but at the same time society should be arranged so that those who are honest are rewarded and those who are corrupt are punished if if both of these go together then the right action becomes easier and krishna actually uses dharma in both these senses dharma can be referred to individual intention and action when arjuna is asking that dharma i want to know what is dharma so that is i want to know what is the right action for me but in this chapter a famous verse we will be discussing dharma samsthapana arthaya sambhavami yogi so that dharma when krishna is referring to is that is actually social arrangement more specifically like socio political arrangement by which people find it easier to do the right thing so that is also dharma so in one sense if you consider we talked yesterday about see many of these concepts in some ways are related i talked about sacrifice or yagya now sacrifice is the act of giving up some impulsive pleasure so that we can belong to a larger whole so now that will be a key theme in this chapter so i'm first introducing the theme of the chapter before we move to the chapter now that is also related with dharma now dharma can refer to what an individual does for society but dharma can also refer to what the society does for the individual so a dharmic society has to be both ways that when we that individuals need to be doing their part in maintaining the social order whatever order it is but then the social order should also be doing its part like say if we are paying taxes then we should be getting electricity water supply and other amenities from the government so if the government is only taxing taxes that is an exploitative government on the other hand if the citizen is only taking facilities and not giving taxes then that is a deceptive citizen that is a irresponsible citizen so there has to be this reciprocation between the individual and the larger whole so krishna says that uh, krishna till now has talked about how at a individual level the individual should set the right example the individual should not instruct other individuals in a way that is disruptive for them individuals should act according to their nature now that is all important but it's not that doing the right thing is not just the individual's responsibility it is also society's responsibility for example say if in a society somebody if somebody has the inclination to become a teacher but in the society doesn't pay teachers at all now obviously teachers will never be paid as much as business people that is just natural by shares they are totally into money so their focus on money will be much more but teachers are more brahmanical they don't they're not interested in money but you cannot say that they should not care for money at all if society does not provide people those who are say brahmanically oriented the the it does not provide them some financial support then it will be very difficult even if they are they are teachers it will be very difficult for them to be teachers on the other hand somebody is a businessman and they are wealth creators basically they may, they create wealth for themselves but they also create wealth for society but if society starts putting too many rules and regulations too many taxes then what will happen is this is what happened to some extent communism the whole idea was that the wealthy must be exploited the wealthy got wealthy only by exploiting others now that's possible but the wealthy could have got wealthy because they are talented because they are dedicated but when all those who are wealthy it's assumed that they are exploitative and therefore what will society do take all the wealth away from the wealthy and redistribute it to the poor now what happens is that 
if take wealth is taken away from the wealthy and given to the poor, it is not that everybody becomes equally wealthy. Actually, everybody becomes equally poor. <laughs> Why? First of all, there is not so much wealth that everybody can become wealthy. And secondly, when you take away wealth from the wealthy, then the who is going to create wealth? And those who could be creators of wealth, they will also start thinking, anyway, I am not going to get anything from this. Why should I work so hard? So in, in the communist government, so basically, what I'm talking about is there is an individual and social. Both has to be fostered together. Hmm? We don't want to go into hmm, specifics of any particular form of government. But Krishna's focus here will now shift to how it is the onus that he he is telling Arjuna, you act according to your nature. But Krishna is saying that I have also made arrangements by which society can be arranged. So that dharma can be followed. And that arrangement is, Krishna says, I give knowledge to those who are the rulers of society. And I do this from the beginning of time. So, chapter 3 is more about individual choice. Chapter 4 is more about social arrangement. And the social arrangement that Krishna says, I do it. How do I do it? By giving knowledge, giving wisdom to the rulers. So Krishna says, so both of these are required for doing dharma. And he says, I gave this knowledge right in the beginning of creation. And from there onwards, through a succession, the knowledge kept coming down and Krishna uses a key word over here Raj Rishi now Raja is a ruler Rishi is a seer now this is an actually a, a great combination if it is there the the king is the king the ruler is one who basically controls the outer world. But if that person is also a seer, then that is the best situation. That person is a visionary. That person also sees that while material goods are to be arranged, but ultimately there are non-material goods also. The people don't just become happy by providing them food, clothing, shelter. Of course that's required. But there are, there are non-material goods also to be required. So the, so the ruler and the seer. So if the ruler what it does is, they provide, the ruler part of the king is meant to provide material goods, not just rule and dominate. And seer is the one by which it promotes the non-material good of people. And there is spiritual growth also to be sought. So this is the knowledge Krishna says, I give with time. I give across time. Or I give at the start of time. But then what happens? Krishna says, Entropy comes in. He doesn't use the word entropy. Uh, but, Sakale Neha Mahata. What happens? By the power of time, there is, the knowledge gets lost. Basically, there is degeneration over generations. <laughs> so, this it is, it is naturally things decline. You see, the nature of the world is that there has to be con constant vigilance, constant protection. And although people can be well intentioned, people can be competent, but over a period of time, things just start going down. And when the degeneration over generation happens, Krishna says, what happens? I personally intervene to give that knowledge. And he says, I am going to give that knowledge to you, o Arjuna. Because you are also a Raja Rishi. You are also a saintly king. And specifically he says that you are, you are devoted to me. You are a friend to me. You are basically a worthy candidate for gaining this knowledge. Now at this point, when Krishna starts speaking this, uh, Arjuna says, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, uh, you are talking about the dawn of creation, you are talking about Surya Dev, 
it is to whom I gave this knowledge. He says, you know, Surude, he is much older to you. How did you give this knowledge to him? So here, what is happening is, <coughs> in the Gita, uh, within the narrative of the Gita, on. by the power of time. <laughs> okay. So, in the Gita, Krishna has still now not explicitly emphasized that I am God. Now, in one sense, we could say Arjuna knows that Arjuna knows about Krishna's divinity. But within the narrative of the Gita, there are a few verses where Krishna has mentioned about his divinity. But Krishna is a focused teacher. Focused teacher means the focus is on the subject, not on the teacher. So, for example, if, say, somebody is teaching the Bhagavad Gita, now, if they te just teach the Bhagavad Gita well and they focus on teaching the content of the Gita, then people will, people will start hearing, people start learning. If that teacher starts spending a lot of time saying, you know, you know, I have taught the Bhagavad Gita for 25 years and I have gone here and spoken this and I have done that. Well, sometimes you may need to est establish your credentials. But the focus should be on the subject. Teaching should not become an ego trip for the teacher, isn't it? So, in the in the section on karma yoga, Krishna is focusing on karma yoga, and that's why he doesn't talk much about his position. Now, in the bhakti yoga chapter, which will start from seventh on section, some seventh chapter onwards, there he'll focus on his position, and the, we will talk more about that at that time, but in Bhakti Yoga, Bhakti is to be performed to a particular person and for that, the, the role of that person, the beauty of that person, the greatness of that person is essential to know. So, so when Krishna is a focused teacher, so when he is teaching Karma Yoga, at that time, there is little mention of himself little mention of his position. But when he talks about Bhakti Yoga, there is abundant mention. There is abundant, not just mention, but explanation of his position. So, why the difference? The difference is because what is required in the case of the subject. Say, Karma Yoga requires the focus to understand how karma is to be done. Bhakti Yoga requires explanation not just how bhakti is to be done, but also to whom bhakti is to be done and why it is so important. Generally speaking, when any subject knowledge is to be given, there is the means and the end. This is called as the path and the purpose or the sadhan and the sadhya. Now, in Karma Yoga, the means is Karma, of course, Nishkam Karma, detached Karma. The ends is Moksha, it's liberation. Now, liberation is something to be understood as of value for everyone. Arjuna's concern is that I don't want to be entangled. So, Krishna does not have to explain Moksha, the value, the importance, the necessity of Moksha. So, Krishna, while teaching Karma Yoga, focuses primarily on Karma. He mentioned many times that this will lead to liberation. Now, in <coughs> Bhakti Yoga, the means is Bhakti and the ends is Bhagavan. So, what happens is, Bhagavan, it is very much, so both of these are actually a part of the subject. And Bhagavan happens to be Krishna. So therefore, Krishna talks about himself there. However, at this particular point, so this is actually this is an answer to the question, does Krishna brag about himself? Does Krishna just, is Krishna egoistic or just bragging about himself? Actually, Krishna is not. 
Krishna is avoiding referring to his position unless the subject requires it. <coughs> so, but here at this particular point, because Arjuna asks a question, therefore Krishna will talk about his position. And Krishna will say that I have, that both of us have been through many lives. But you, Arjuna, have forgotten. That is, I remember. And how is that possible? Because I am the Supreme Lord. And then he says, I have descended to this world. For what purpose? To establish dharma in this world. And then, he says, when I come to establish dharma, how does he establish dharma? He talks about an elaborate arrangement for the establishment of dharma. So, basically, what is the focus over here? The social arrangement by which individual dutifulness can be facilitated. So, let's talk, look at that social arrangement. It has broadly three parts to it. But, uh, before we go to it, how Krishna says, first of all, what he does is universal. <clears throat> so, let's recite this verse. This is the 11th verse. That, ye yatha means as people, maam prapadyante, as people surrender to me. Ye yatha maam prapadyante, ye yatha maam prapadyante, taams, taams means unto them, tathaiva, similarly. Bhajamyaham, I reward them. Tams tathaiva bhajamyaham. Tams tathaiva bhajamyaham. Then, mama vartama. Mama vartama is my path. Anuvartante. Anuvartante means to follow. My path, everyone follows. Mama vartama anuvartante. Mama vartama anuvartante. Manushyaha. Manushyaha is people. Partha Arjuna Sarvasha. All people follow. Manushya Partha Sarvasha. Manushya Partha Sarvasha. Let's recite it together. Ye Ramam Prapadyante Tamsa Taiva Vajamyam Mama Vartamanu Vartante Manushya Partha Sarvasha. So, there are two distinct parts to this verse. The first is how Krishna says he is reciprocal. Reciprocal means that he reciprocates with people. And second, he says how he is universal. That universal means everyone is on my path. So Krishna's characteristics are two part: reciprocal and universal. So Let's look at this gradually. Now, one common notion in India about the teachings of broadly the Vedic tradition and specifically about the Bhagavad Gita is that all paths, what do they say? Lead to the same goal. Now, Now, there is, there are many ways in which this can be challenged. The first is at a purely logical level. The Prabhupada says that if all paths lead to the same goal, then if that is what Krishna is teaching, then Krishna has no need for teaching. Because whatever people will do, they will come to him. <laughs> Isn't it? So, logically, what happens is, it just makes Gita unnecessary. If whatever you do, you will come to him, then what is the point of uh, Krishna telling Arjuna? Even Arjuna asking Krishna also. And now, from a logical perspective, we can also say, that we observe that different choices 
bring about different consequences. Now, Prabhupada used the example, if you get into a train which is going to Kolkata, you will go to Kolkata. Get into a train, you will go to Delhi, you will go to Delhi. Now, the impersonalists argue that actually this is a wrong metaphor. They say because the ultimate reality is not like Kolkata or Delhi, the ultimate reality exists everywhere. So, therefore, this metaphor is wrong. The problem is that they are taking the wrong point of the metaphor. The focus is not on the destination per se. Yes, Krishna exists everywhere. Or even if you say the ultimate Brahma Yoti, that's existing everywhere. But that does not mean that every action that we do will lead to perception of God. If we come to a temple and pray, we will feel closer to God. If we go to a bar and drink, <laughs> if we think we are closer to God, then that means we are only closer to illusion. <laughs> so, so the point is that, yes, the absolute truth exists everywhere. But perception of the absolute truth is not equally accessible everywhere. The two are different things. That the if you consider the absolute truth hmm, uh, exists everywhere. Hmm, that is definitely true. Hmm, but the perception is available equally everywhere. That means, whichever direction we go, that is not true. So we have to, we have to make those choices that will may bring us closer to the Lord. And that is why the other part of this was important. Krishna said, yes, all people are on my path. But I will, that translation, whatever it is, that is translated in two different ways. But we will come to that. But the other part is Krishna is saying, Yethamam prapadyante tam sadaiva vajamya. Krishna is saying that it is not that everybody comes to me. He says, as all people approach me, I reward them accordingly. So it is that God can be perceived more, say, when we come towards Sattva God becomes perceived less when we go towards Sattva So all paths lead to the same goal. If it is taken literally, logically, it just makes no sense. Because it, it, logically it is a problem. Now, apart from that, logically, we can also look at it scripturally. Now, scripturally, we can look at the content of the verse here. We can look at the context of the verse. So, here scripturally, there are many, many scriptures. But we are focusing primarily on the Gita here. So, if we look at the verse, what is it exactly saying? Mama Vartmanu Vartante Manushaha Partha Sarvasha. Now, Vartma is path, Anuvartante is follow, Manushaha is people, and Sarvasha is all. So, normally in grammar, the adjective comes close to the noun. Now, sometimes, the, sometimes the adjective can be away from the noun also. That is called transposed adjective. But that is done in special situations. So for example, the traveller walked a lonely path. Now, if the lonely traveller walked a path, you can say. So, uh, so basically, the Sarva Shaha, it is closer to what? Is it closer to Vartama or Manushaha? So basically, depending on where you apply that adjective, it can say all people are on my path or all paths lead to me. Okay? That all adjective where we apply it. So both translations, we could say, okay, from a grammatical point of view, they are defensive. Within the rules of Sanskrit grammar, they are possible. But generally speaking, the idea is that the adjective comes closer to the noun. 
Now, having said this, if we look at overall what Krishna is teaching, Krishna is cl just clearly before this is differentiate between the uh, divine and the demonia. Paritrana, sadhuna, vinasha, chitushkuta. So, if all paths lead to him, then why differentiate between the divine and the demonia? Both will come to him. After this, Krishna will say that though the great souls have understood this knowledge and acted accordingly. And they have gained liberation. So, you should act accordingly. It's going again. It's connected, it's Let's bring it in. So, there are many verses where Krishna will clearly say that this action will lead to this, this action will lead to that. So, now we could say, so what I am saying over here is, in content that this all applies, can apply to people or it can apply to paths. Now both may be possible, but all people is more probable, logically speaking. But more importantly, look at the context. When Krishna is speaking, Krishna is just before and after this. So this is 4.11. So just a few verses before this. Where is 4.8? He has said that he has differentiated between the divine and the demoniac. And then a few verses later, in 15th, again he has differentiated. He recommends a particular path. But anyway, so my point is that this is not logical. The whole Gita it's not only logical, it is not also scriptural. That all paths lead to the same goal. Now having said this, there is some basis to it. The various paths in the world, they can be put into two broad categories. Mm -hmm. There are some paths which are exclusivist. Exclusivist means they claim that we have exclusive rights to God. <coughs> Just like the World Cup, ESPN may say exclusively on ESPN. So here only, nowhere else. So exclusives are those who say that we have exclusive right to God. Only if you follow us, then you will come to us. Come going at God. Otherwise, you will not. Now, exclusives are generally in thought. That means they think that, that ours is the only way. Now, exclusive then when they become another they are extremists also. Now when they, they are extremists, they are also in action. So exclusivists think and talk that we are the own, ours is the only way. Extremists are actually kinder. They say, the exclusivists say, if you don't follow our path, you are going to go to hell. The extremists say, anyway you are going to go to hell, why delay it? We will send you right away. <laughs> we will help you get there faster. So those are extremists. And broadly speaking, the Abrahamic religions, Abrahamic religions are Judaism, Christianity and Islam. All of them, they accept this idea of exclusivism. Not only accept, they propagate it actively. So Judaism has the idea of Jews are the chosen people of God. Now the Jews may not be very aggressive, they are very prosperous. They may not, may not be directly violent. And the Christians have had their history of intolerance. And uh, so they say Jesus is the only way. Now, what happens, Mom? So, when Muhammad came, at that time, basically, in the Jewish, in the Old Testament, there is the idea that there is a prophet who is going to come. There is some Messiah, Messiah who is going to come. There is some Savior who is going to come. So initially, the Moses came and those who accepted Moses as the saviour, they were Jews. Now those who accepted Jesus as that saviour, some people said, okay, there is another saviour going to come. Those who accepted Jesus as the saviour, they became Christians. Now those who came later, they after uh, those later, Muhammad came. And those who accepted Muhammad as the saviour, they became Muslims. Now what, have, what happened? This was going on. Muhammad said, enough now. I am the seal of all prophets. There is no prophet going to come after me. And he says, all prophets are meant for me. So, are, are meant to culminate in me. So, uh, 
<clears throat> what happens is Christians and Muslims themselves have some tension. Both of them accept the idea that Moses was a great Moses was a great teacher, Moses was a prophet. Now, but what Christ, what Muslims say is that that Christians have the idea that there is the second coming of Jesus. Yes, Jesus will come again, and at that time, all those who have believed Jesus, they will be delivered. They will be taken to heaven. Everybody else will be condemned to hell forever. Mm-hmm. Now, Muslims also accept that there is going to be a second coming of Jesus. But they say at that time, Jesus will reveal that Muhammad is actually the seal of all prophets. <laughs> <laughs> and those who don't accept it, they will be rejected not only by Muhammad but even by Jesus. <laughs> so basically, this whole game of historical reinterpretation goes on. But everybody is trying to claim that our way is not just the best way, it's the only way. Not everybody, at least in the Abrahamic tradition, they claim that ours is the only way. Now, there is the opposite of this is pluralist. Pluralist is that the only way is says always. Now, this is often thought to be the Hinduism, <coughs> teaching of Hinduism. But this is Hinduism deviated from the Vedas. This is not the actual teaching of the Vedas. Now, every religion, not criticizing Hinduism per se, every religion, the way it gets spread across the world, it may follow its starting scripture to different degrees. And to different degrees, it may get deviated. So, the main, I would say rather than the mainstream, rather than this being the teaching of Hinduism, this is the conception about Hinduism among people. We say all paths are right and there is some truth to it. But it can go towards an extreme. Say for example, we say all paths are right. But if somebody says my path is atheism. And atheism means God doesn't exist. So if God doesn't exist is right, then the path to God, how can they be right? <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> so, all paths can't be right. Now, in between is actually the teaching of the Gita. This can be called as inclusivism. Inclusivism means there is one purpose which includes many paths. It is, there is one purpose which is to rise to spiritual consciousness, to rise to divine consciousness. But for that, there can be many paths. So in our tradition, this what is this inclusivism? Let me try it. What is the teaching of the Gita and how can we explain it? Inclusivism is one purpose which includes many paths. So the simple metaphor to illustrate this could be the illustration of a mountain. Now, exclusivist whole that this is the only path up the mountain. Now you may say, okay, why should there be only this path up the mountain? Then we can have multiple paths up the mountain. Isn't it? Now, however, pluralists, they hold that all paths will take you up the mountain. But some paths can take you into a valley. Some paths can just take you away from the mountain. Some paths can keep you circling around the mountain. Isn't it? So inclusivists, sorry, pluralists hold that all paths lead to the same goal. But that is not true. So now inclusivists say that there is one purpose. One purpose is what? To go to the top of the mountain. And that purpose includes many paths. Now, so now what is exactly the mountain over here? If we consider the mountain, is this color visible? Okay. So there is the bottom of the mountain and there is the top of the mountain. So the top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness. Ultimately centers in love of God. And at the bottom of the mountain is material consciousness, which centers on love of material things.
So the idea is that we need to move from the love of material things toward the love of God. And in principle, this is, pos this is possible through Islam, this is possible through Christianity, this is possible through Judaism, this is possible through the Vedic path, this is possible through Krishna consciousness. And Srila Prabhupada acknowledged this. He would say that Jesus, when, the, when the, some Christian would ask him about Jesus, he would say, Jesus is our Guru. He said he had so much love for God that he was ready to lay down his life for the sake of God. Anyone who has so much love is definitely worthy of our respect in our worship. So our tradition is such that we acknowledge that love of God is possible through various paths. And Prabhupada was in Iran at that time. He was see before the till 1979 and 79, before the Iranian Revolution happened. Iran was among the most liberal countries in the Middle East. And it was actually progressing also. But after the uh, 79 revolution, when the King Shah was deposed and uh, Ayatollah came to power, after that it turned very intolerant. So Prabhupada had gone to Iran once. And then while he was talking with uh, his disciples and some students, in the background, the Shahada Namaz prayer started. And as it started, Prabhupada closed his eyes and folded his hands. And he very prayerfully heard out the entire prayers. And he opened his eyes and Prabhupada's eyes were better. Wasn't that beautiful, Prabhupada? And then a devotee told Prabhupada, but Prabhupada, wouldn't it be better if they're chanting Hare Krishna? And Prabhupada looked almost hurt. He said, no, why are you making me sentient? He says, they are worshipping God in their way. And we are worshipping God in our way. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur says that you know, if we go to the place of worship uh, of some other tradition, uh, what should be our mood over there? So he says that we should sit there, we should be there in a mood of respect. Thinking that the God that I worship has manifested himself in some way that I don't understand. And I appreciate the compassion of God for manifesting in this way to reach out to these people. And seeing how compassionate God is, my devotion to God in the form that I know is increasing. So basically the idea is, to go back to the mountain metaphor, if I am climbing up the mountain from a particular path, then I don't have to spend my time going round and round at the bottom of the mountain pulling everyone down from their paths. My focus should be climbing up the mountain. And while climbing up the mountain, if say, I am getting clearer and clearer sign of the vision of the peak. And say somebody else is climbing up the mountain from another side and they have got a vision of the peak. Now if they share that vision, that can be uplifting for me. That can be inspiring for me. So the point over here is that when we talk about conversion, conversion can be either conversion can be either horizontal or vertical. Horizontal means what? Somebody is at the bottom of the mountain in one place and is move down to the bottom of the mountain in another place. But from there they don't climb up the mountain, they stay at the bottom only. So it's like so there are some people who may be poor Hindus from a lower caste, they may feel unincluded. And some Christian missionaries come to them and they say that we'll give you some money, we will get you give you education, we'll give you free medical treatment, we'll get your daughter married, we'll, we'll take care of your loans. And they say you become a Christian. And they become a Christian. Now what is happening is that that conversion is a horizontal conversion. Is what happens is basically they were Hindu materialists and they became 
Christian materialists. Hmm? So it is basically shifting from one part at the bottom of the mountain to another part at the bottom of the mountain. That kind of horizontal conversion. So if somebody just moves from here to here, hmm? this is a horizontal conversion. And this does not lead to much any spiritual advancement. This is only for gaining political power, gaining social influence, just increasing the numbers game. So, now on the other hand, when somebody goes up this path, this is a vertical conversion, where a person is going from being materialist to being spiritualist. So, Shri Prabhupada said that this is the conversion. The word conversion itself has got a negative connotation nowadays. But the transformation that we are seeking is this transformation. That we want to elevate people from where they are towards a higher spiritual consciousness. So, in general, in interfaith or for when dealing with people of other faiths, Prabhupada had two distinct approaches. If they were nominal followers, nominal means they were just born in that particular faith but they knew nothing about it, they are not really interested in it, they are not following it. Then Prabhupada would encourage Krishna consciousness. He says, why? Because this path is like, there can be different paths which go up the mountain but that does not necessarily mean all the paths are equally smooth for going up the mountain. Some path might be easier, some path might be tougher, some path might be more rocky, some path might be more swampy, uh, some path might be more forested. So different paths can be different. So in Kali Yuga, by the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, the path of Krishna consciousness is relatively easier for going up the mountain. And therefore, this path is what is recommended. But if somebody were a dedicated follower, then Prabhupada would focus on the principles of dharma. So for example, if somebody were a dedicated Christian, Prabhupada would encourage them to stop eating meat. How can you truly claim to love God if you are actually not following the basic principles of dharma? So, what is happening over here is Krishna, that the Vedic path is inclusive. Krishna says, all people are on my path. What it means is that actually everybody is somewhere on this mountain. But some people are going up the mountain, some people are going around the mountain, some people are going away from the mountain. So, if we envision this, like we can take it as one path, but if we envision it as like one huge expressway. Now, at the top is Krishna. Now some people are going towards Krishna, some people may be going away from Krishna, some people are staying there wherever they are, some people may be going crisscross, not knowing where they are going, some people may just go to sleep where they are. <laughs> <laughs> but so everybody is on, on that path. However, it depends on them where they are going. And Krishna says, for everyone I create arrangements. So those who worship me, they will come to me. Those who want, now coming to me takes time. If somebody wants quick results, then they may worship the devtas and they will get quick results. If somebody wants to just make it good in the world, then for them, there is a Varnashram system. You act according to your nature and then you can get gradually elevated. So Krishna says, these are all the various social arrangements I have made. Now, at Krishna, when Krishna spoke the Gita, Christianity, Islam, Judaism were not there. But even when Krishna spoke the Gita, at that time there were Shaivites were there, there were different kinds of worshippers were there. Now, it's important to understand that when the war was fought, it is important, the war was fought between the Kauravas and the Pandavas. Now, we, it was not, the war was not fought it was not that the Pandavas were devotees and the Kauravas were non-devotees. Or rather, more specifically, you could put it this way, that it was not that 
the Pandavas at that time were Vaishnavas and Kauravas were a Vaishnavas. It was not like that. Basically, on the Pandava side, there was Drona, Tadatuna. There was Drupada. And this Drupada was actually a Shaivite. Drupada's family deity was Lord Shiva. On the other hand, on the Kaurava side, there was Bhishma. And Bhishma was a Vaishnava. Similarly, there was Bhavishrava. Bhavishrava was also a Vaishnava. So, the war was not fought to establish Bhakti. See, the war was fought for Dharma. Not Bhakti. Now, what is the difference between the two of these? That, see, Dharma in this case, you remember what is the meaning of dharma? Social. Yes, social order. And bhakti is devotion. So, dharma has to be established. But bhakti has to be inspired. So, established means it can be established it can even be enforced so but bhakti has to be actually inspired individually it, it is voluntary so somebody says that i want uh, i want follow the traffic rules and then you have to be put in jail and somebody says i want chant Hare krishna no we don't have to put that person in jail you know if bhakti is forced that is not bhakti that won't be love isn't it so Krishna says, I come to establish dharma, dharma samsthapana And the, is, is bhakti not important for Krishna? Is bhakti is important. But Krishna says, bhakti is to be inspired. Those who come to know me, they will love me and they will attain me. So in 4, 7 and 8, Krishna talks about dharma. And 4, 9 and 10, Krishna talks about bhakti. And Krishna says, yeh tham Those who want to follow dharma, for them there is dharma. Those who want to follow bhakti, for them there is bhakti. So this is the Krishna's principle of reciprocity. Reciprocity means Krishna is saying that as you want, you can follow. Now if you don't follow dharma also, then the way I reciprocate will be by punishing you. If you follow dharma, I will empower you. If you follow bhakti, I will liberate you. So there, is, there are different ways in which the reciprocation comes up. So, reciprocation of Krishna. So, if somebody doesn't, fall, if somebody is doing adharma, then it's punishment. That is Krishna's reciprocation. Somebody is following dharma, then there is empowerment. Every government, every society needs responsible people in society. If somebody is following bhakti, then there is not just empowerment, empowerment is what you can say enchantment. That person will become attracted to me and that will come to me. There will be liberation. Ultimately, that person will come to Krishna. That person will become enchanted. So Krishna is reciprocating with different people accordingly. So Krishna, so this is again Krishna's inclusiveness. Inclusiveness means that there can be not only different parts of the mountain. We remember yesterday we talked that there, there can, you can go up the mountain at different pace also. Somebody can go slower, somebody can go faster. But Krishna reciprocates with everyone. Okay. So let's look at. I have begun from the dawn of creation a system for wisdom's transmission. Through a chain of saintly rulers across many a generation, that wisdom was lost due to time's power to cause degeneration. 
and that wisdom will be restored by my present instruction to you who are a dear friend rich with devotion how did you give wisdom to an ancient seer when to that being by birth you are junior many many births both you and i have undergone my memory of them remains clear though yours is gone of all beings i remain the lord unborn and unending even when in this world of illusion i am descending to disempower the demoniac who spread a dharma and empower the divine thus establishing dharma those who true grasp truly the mystery of my birth and action don't take worry birth but come to me the supreme destination seeking me and giving up attachment fear and anger gaining wisdom pure and austere they attain my shelter as people approach me so i reward them one on one on the path to me without exception is everyone to other gods some offer devotion because they see quick gratification for all people according to their disposition have i created a system of occupation in all such actions i never indulge in discrimination knowing this truth about me past seekers have attained liberation now this is this chapter is a long chapter this is 1 to 15 we are discussing now because this was very important broad section now i will go through the remaining two sections a little faster after this krishna will say okay so i have made the social arrangement what is the social arrangement primarily it is in terms of giving knowledge and then of course creating structures to implement that knowledge it's like uh, if there's a pandemic then an expert doctor comes and tells how the patients are to be treated and then help set up the system by which the patients can actually be treated now the system gets disrupted the doctor comes back again and sets the system again so like that krishna has set up the system now what is now after telling this arrangement of the social system in which knowledge is given now krishna will start telling what is the knowledge that knowledge is essentially about karma karma means that about action so now we will discuss one of the most entertainingly confusing verses in the gita <laughs> why entertainingly confusing it is just fun to recite this verse also and it is fun to be confused by this verse so let's try to recite this krishna is saying kar karmanya akarma in action see in action hmm yah pashye do so see karmanya akarma yah pashye karmanya akarma yah pashye akarmani cha karma yah in and uh, so in action see in action and in in action see action okay akarmani cha karma yah akarmani cha karma yah such a person is among people among human beings such a person is buddhiman manushyeshu is such a person is wise sabuddhiman manushyeshu sabuddhiman manushyeshu and that person yukta that person is well situated krutsna karma kre that person is well situated in whatever work they do they will not get entangled संयुक्त कृष्ण कर्म करे संयुक्त कृष्ण कर्म करे लेट्स रिसाइट इट टुगेदर कर्मण्या कर्मया पश्ये अकर्मणि च कर्मया स बुद्धिमान मनुष्येषु संयुक्त कृष्ण कर्म करे सो लेट्स सी व्हाई दिस वर्स इज एंटरटेनिंगली कंफ्यूजिंग एज आई सेड समटाइम्स यू नो सम पीपल आर कंफ्यूज्ड Just see their confused faces every day. <laughs> so, it is of course it is enlightening, and then it is not confusing. But karma nya akarma yha pashi. So he says action. See action in inaction, and see inaction in action. So it is a bit of a both a tongue twister and a brain twister. <laughs> So see action in action and action in action. 
So let's try to simplify this and understand what it means. Now the words, Sanskrit words are karma and a karma. Now karma has two different meanings. It can literally live, refer to activity. Everybody does some karma. That means everybody is active. That is activity. But another meaning of karma is also action that brings react, that causes reaction. So conversely, a karma can refer to inactivity. It can also refer to action that doesn't cause reaction. So once we understand these two different meanings, then understanding this verse will become a little clearer. But before I, so what is Krishna saying over here? That karmanya akarmanya pashet. That sometimes you may do action, but you may get no reaction. And sometimes you may not do action, and still you will be responsible. You will be getting a reaction. So how is that possible? Let's consider, say if there are, there are riots and there is a police over there. Now, if the police attack the rioters, attack the riot, maybe lati charge or they have to shoot in the air or they use stun guns, if they finally have to use guns. Now, they attack. Now, there is action, but will the police be arrested for that? There'll be, there'll be, this attack is action. But there will be no reaction, so no bad reaction, no bad action for that. No bad consequence of that. But on the other hand, if the police stay inactive, now what that means? They are doing no action, they are doing a karma. And the police stay inactive during riots. Is that a good thing? No. There will be reaction, there will be an inquiry, there will be disciplinary action. Why did you remain silent at this time? Is it? So, at first glance, you may say that attacking someone is a bad thing. But in some situations, the activity of attacking may be a good thing. And inactivity when somebody should be attacking will be a bad thing. So, that means, in generally when there are crimes, there are probably two kinds of crimes. There are crimes of commission. Commission means either you do the crime or you tell others to do the crime. And there is crime of omission. Omission means you don't do what you are expected to do. Turn a blind eye towards something. Now, by not doing something, a person becomes a criminal. Now, in the context of the Bhagavad Gita, what does this mean? Krishna is saying, Arjuna, that if you fight, although you are thinking fighting is a bad thing, if you are fighting to assist me in establishing dharma, you will not get any reaction. But on the other hand, if you don't fight, well, you are a Kshatriya. That is your duty to fight. If you don't fight, then you will get a reaction. So, um, sorry? No, karma means, okay. See, karma is simple. Good. To, good. Uh, to, um, ex, good. That I need to clarify this. Good that you raise the question. See, basically, one can be just activity in general. So, broad, and the other is, now, does, do all activities cause reactions? That is the key point to Krishna is saying. So, karmanya akarmaya pashe. I am going to explain this. Karmanya akarma. What does this mean? In action, see inaction. That means you can do action but get no reaction. So here karmanya means action and akarma means that you are doing something which you get no reaction. And then akarmani cha karmaya. That means, here, so here you could say, sorry, instead of thinking, making more confusion, action or you can use the word activity over here. You are active, but you get no reaction. Here, there is inaction or in the sense of inactivity. 
A person is doing nothing, but still they will get reaction. Akarmani chakarmaya. So basically what Krishna is saying here is, I don't just get carried away by experience. You may think fighting is a bad thing, but not fighting could be a worse thing. Because your duty is important. And don't neglect your duty. So let's look at this. So, is anyone good at reading English poetry? Would you like to read this? Okay. Knowing this truth about me, past seekers have attained depression. Which action breeds what result? That is tough to discern. Which action brings depression? From me, you can learn. In determining reaction, more important than action is the underlying intention. That is the learned vision. Inaction chosen irresponsibly will bring reaction. Action executed responsibly will bring no reaction. Those who are free from those who act free from selfish desire have all reactions burned by the fire of wisdom in action manifested as the mood of sacrifice. So a police person who shoots somebody because they are angry with a neighbor or someone, they will be culpable. But a police person who shoots somebody who is a criminal, action that is free from selfish desire, they will not get any reaction. So that is, the fire is, the fire of wisdom in action manifested as the mood of sacrifice. So what is the mood of sacrifice? that seeks material things only for sustenance, not indulgence. Krishna talks about how when we work in this world, we are not greedy for material things. When everything is seen as it is potentially spiritual, all action becomes a sacrifice. Nothing remains a mere ritual. This is that Krishna talks about how various activities can be performed in the mood of sacrifice. To perform sacrifice, the ways are many. Intelligence, senses, time, breath or money. All these and more, whatever we have, can be offered. Through sacrifice, though sacrifice done in knowledge is to be preferred. Honoring the remnants of sacrifice brings purification. And the sacrifice, wise and sacrificer, wise and free from wise, reaches liberation. So now, why is Krishna talking about sacrifice over here? Because sacrifice is a pure activity. In sacrifice, you can say there is some destruction. You put food into it, you put uh, oil into it, it gets burnt. But that burning <coughs> is not just a reason. Burning is uplifting, it's purifying, it's sacred. So the Acharya has explained as a verse to this effect. In the, in the Mahabharata also, that the whole Kurukshetra battlefield is like a sacrifice. And Arjuna is the priest. And when the priest is pouring ghee or whatever the spoon. So Arjuna's bow is the spoon. And the Kauravas are the Ahuti. <laughs> and the actual battle that is going to happen. The battlefield is Yagyasthali and the battle is the fire. <coughs> so Krishna is saying, it's the fire in which this whole battle is going to take place. And then Krishna says that the point is that this is the knowledge that he he is giving to Arjuna. But Krishna says that this is the no arrangement for this knowledge I have made. That I have this in the past was going on, now I am doing it for you. But then how can people in general know it? He says, for that you need to go to a guru. And that's what comes up now after this. From those who have those, from those who have seen the truth, humbly learn the knowledge of reality that will burn. The illusion that anything or anyone exists separate from me. And that knowledge will take you across the ocean of misery to eternity. This wisdom act as is illusion's ultimate cure. Compared with it, nothing in the world is so pure. This wisdom is gained by the faithful, but it eludes those who are doubtful. 
Take this, the sword of wisdom, arise and fight. Slay the doubt that stops you from doing what is right. So Krishna concludes with calling Arjuna to fight. But the fighting is, he's saying it's not just an outer war against your enemy. You have to fight a war with the sword of knowledge against your doubts, against your illusion. And this is the bigger war that the Bhagavad Gita calls everyone to fight. So, this particular section, to some extent, I rushed through the later part of the section for one main reason, that this topic of how we can act without being bound. How does action occur? And how does knowledge keep us free from bondage? That is the subject in the next chapter. In the fifth chapter. So we will discuss it over there. I will summarize what we discussed. We are discussing the chapter 4 overview. So we focused on how um, when Dharma is to be practiced, there is both an individual responsibility and a social responsibility. A social arrangement you can say. So the individual arrangement was focused on focus chapter 3 and the social arrangement is chapter 4. What is the social arrangement? That is the basically the wisdom to reorganize society. Reorganize society in such a way that people can live, live prosperously and grow spiritually. So that is the wisdom to reorganize society. So Krishna says that, that Krishna says that the system that he creates is from the start of creation, dawn of creation, there is the knowledge that is given across generations. And how is it given? Through through what? Saintly kings. They are like they are rulers and seers. So through that knowledge is given. Then we discuss how here specifically. Uh, Krishna, Krishna talks about his position. Krishna's position in the in his, he, it's uh, it's emphasized only in the bhakti yoga section. In the karma yoga section, it's not because Krishna is a focused teacher. But here in four point. 5 to 15, it is explained because Arjuna asked the question. Because of Arjuna's question. And then, here we discussed about how Krishna is both reciprocal and universal. So, there we discussed about how, you know, it's not that all paths to same goal or all people are on the it's not the same goal as Krishna. So the, what the more logical we discuss this from a logical perspective and a scriptural perspective. How actually this does not make sense. And then because choices have consequences. Then here we discussed about uh, different paths. They can be exclusivist which hold that my way is the only way then there can be pluralist which hold that all ways are right but in between is inclusivist which holds that there is one purpose and many paths and for that we discuss the mountain metaphor that there can be different paths which go up the mountain but that does not mean that all paths are just they are going to take to because of the mountain so here we discuss that conversion it is meant it is horizontal conversion is not of much use. Like somebody is a Hindu materialist and becomes a Christian materialist. But it is what we want is a vertical conversion where people become elevated from love of material things to love of God. And then we discussed about karma. That karma can have been activity in general or it can mean Action, specific action or that action which causes reaction and then we discuss the 
key to that. They discuss the four eighteen words that that um, that basically karmanya karmanya pashit. So in this verse, what are the focus that? Um, intention with which we do ag action that is much more more important than the action itself. So if our intention is in a mood of sacrifice or service, then we all can be stay 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 pure, pure and we can become liberated. And in fact, all action can be done as a sacrifice. And this we learn from our gurus. And this knowledge, Krishna says, Arjuna, you fight and you will win. Over doubts and delusions that are there inside. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions? Okay, we'll take a few. Yes, please. Pramji, you told that uh, inclusion, the people of the Jewish idea, they said that uh, there are single goals, but many parts can lead to that. But in Shastras, they said that only Krishna consciousness is the way to reach the important. Where does it say that? Well, I don't know whether you can translate Harer Nama into Krishna consciousness. It is, it is chanting all the names of God. But then Nam Nam, there are so many names of the Lord, isn't it? So Prabhupada said that in different traditions there will be different names of God. Chanting. So just chanting the names of God by which we develop love of God, that is the only way. But certainly it's not that the Hare Krishna mantra is the only way. In the verse is Harer Nama Eva Kevala. And Hari is the name of God and Hari, Lord Hari has many different names. Krishna Prabhu. Prabhuji, why is the difference between dharma, religion and bhakti? Because dharma is a matter of social order. That's, that's, that's the confusion that comes up. Nowadays the word dharma means religion. But in the Vedic context, dharma means social order. As I said, the Kurukshetra war was not fought because Duryodhana was a non devotee It was not that suddenly Duryodhana said, okay, I'll chant Hare Krishna, I'll stop the war. No, Duryodhana was doing wrong things. And that has to stop. He was doing all these wrong, terrible things he was doing. So he was a, he was a social disruptor, he was causing social havoc. So, so there is, so dharma is basically the basic harmonious functioning in society. So if I belong to, if, if we stay in a particular country, we follow the rules of that country. That is dharma. If you are a particular family, if you are a particular, particular company. So, you remember, was it I spoke to all of you or I spoke in a previous chapter? I think I spoke in the sacrament that there are many, many, many holes that we belong to. So now, the, who is the ultimate hole? See now, the word dharma is more a sense of order, order or harmony. So remember what dharma means, if I am taking something, I, if I am giving, getting something, I should be giving something. Oh, so that is how harmony is maintained. Now, if you see this is uh, this is a matter of you could say it's logical, it's rational, hmm? it's ethical. It's, if I'm taking something, I should give something. That's logical. That's how society. It's um, okay. Rational, and logical, same thing. It is. It is functional. Functional means functionally it's necessary. But all of these are possible without love. Isn't it? It's like I give access to my government. That doesn't mean I love my government. I follow the rules of traffic. That does not mean I don't love the road traffic system. Now bhakti on the other hand is a matter of love. So now when there is love also there will, it's like, you could say, when there is love, automatically dharma will be there. Because if I, if we love, then also we will naturally follow the order. But love is a higher thing. So this has to be voluntary. It cannot be forced. 
how can you force someone to anyone to love anyone? So love is voluntary. It can be inspired and it is meant to be inspired. So if we come, we hear about Krishna, we learn about Krishna's glories, we will feel inspired to love Krishna. This one, one of the major differences between the Vedic tradition and say the Abrahamic religions. See, both talk about hell. But there is a big difference. In the Vedic tradition, in, in the Abrahamic religions, hell is for non-believers. If you don't believe in Jesus, if you don't believe in Muhammad, if you don't believe in whoever it is, Yahweh, you will go to hell. In the Vedic tradition, hell is for wrongdoers. Hmm? Wrongdoers means that is, this is the Vedic tradition, the Gita teaching. So, it is just because somebody is a chant Hare Krishna, that means it doesn't mean they will go to hell. It depends on how they are living. If somebody is in Sattva Guna, they can become elevated. They are living in Rajoguna, they will stay stagnate. In Tamoguna, they will get degraded. So, hell is for those who are doing wrong. So, it is not that, it is not that, um, Krishna says, you don't believe me, how dare you, I will send you to hell. It is not like that. You see, the world is a place where people have to live cooperatively. If you become a disruptor, then, you have to be removed. So, in the way, in the Abrahamic religions, hell is for condemnation. They use the word damnation. Hmm? But in the Vedic tradition, hell is for reformation. Because, condemnation means because it is permanent. You go to hell and that's where you want to be forever. In the Vedic tradition, Prabhupada was asked, is hell eternal? Prabhupada said, nothing except Devotional service, ecstatic devotional service to Krishna is eternal. Everything else is temporary. It is temporary. So, in hell, people suffer, but after suffering, they love. And then they come out. So, who goes to hell? It is, it is people who do adharma, they go to hell. Now, abhaktas, will they go to hell? Not just because they are abhaktas. If the abhaktas do adharma, then they will go to hell. So, if somebody is an atheist, Hmm. But if they are vegetarian, if they are kind, if they are, uh, if they are well behaved, if they are not doing other work, that doesn't mean they are going to go to hell. Okay. There is a clear difference between dharma and bhakti. Yes, what is religion? religion. What is religion? <coughs> it depends on whom you ask. <laughs> no, because see, words don't have fixed meanings. Word, the meaning is in context. So, religion, if you look at it from the perspective of etymology, it comes from the religare, which actually means to bind back to God. That's, it comes, I think it's Greek or Roman. It's bind back to God. So, in that sense, religion is meant to be a path back to God. Okay. But in today's world, religion is often more of a cultural designation. Hmm. Today's world. Hmm. So, it just refers to, it can refer to how people live. And that includes how people worship. Hmm. But, uh, the worship may be a very small part of it also. Mm -hmm. What is that? Mm -hmm. One of my friends is a Jew. So he was trying to share Krishna. When he became Krishna conscious, he was trying to share Krishna conscious with his relatives. His uncle said, are you trying to convert me? He said, I didn't know that you belong to any religion. He said, I am a Jew. I have been atheist, but I am an atheist Jew. <laughs> <laughs> now, the first commandment of Judaism is love God with all thy heart, all thy soul and all thy mind. So if you say that I am a Jew but I am an atheist, then it is it has just become a cultural designation, isn't it? So that way it's a, so that's why I said what does religion mean? It depends on whom you ask. For many people, say among various religions, each religion can be 
religion can be a spiritual search for god but it can also become a political search for power hmm? so it is possible depending on who is leading that religion and why people are following that religion so if you consider this particular danger this is most in islam why there are many muslims who live very pious lives individually they give charity and they do their prayers so at an individual level islam can be a spiritual search for god but at a societal level at the level of at the social level very frequently islam becomes islamism as they say it becomes a search for power now why is islam uniquely dangerous and this danger is there for all religions but what happens is in general in most traditions the brahmana and the kshatriya roles are separated that see the tradition is that brahmana and kshatriya they two separate things now if you see in the buddhist tradition buddha was the brahmana and ashoka was the kshatriya who eventually spread buddhism key person jesus was the brahmana and then constantine was the king who spread he used military power also but in islam muhammad is both the spiritual teacher and the military leader so because that brahmana kshatriya is combined at in the very genes of islam so because of that what happens is individually people may follow muhammad's teachings and that may spiritually take them towards god but collectively often people look at look at muhammad's military example and war is a dirty business and sometimes unethical methods have to be used this has to be done that has to be done so people follow that example and so it can become a very much a political search for power Now this danger. I am not saying this is this danger is not there in any other religion. It's possible everywhere. Religion can be used for political purposes by anyone. But uh, the so it depends on what somebody is thinking of as a religion. That's why there is religion as a spiritual search for God. But how religion is being practiced in society that can vary from time, place, circumstance. Just like Prabhu Prabhu Patil had said, "Mukho, that." There may that thing without which so, uh, one existent or uh, one cannot exist. Yeah, that's fine. That's true. So, so, yeah. so, so basically, it's it's uh, the word has many different meanings. But even this, you can say, if you are going in traffic and not following traffic rules, you won't exist. Is it right? <laughs> there is there is there is accident. Say, if you are in a flying plane, I don't follow the rules given by the by by the staff. Then we trouble. So basic dharma is that action which keeps us in harmony. So harmony with our nature, harmony with our situation, harmony ultimately with God. So dharma has many different meanings, and that is definitely meaning. But that meaning also applies over here. Dharma doesn't have only one meaning. Yes. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. We learned that uh, the wisdom was passed. Uh, Since the dawn, dawn of creation by Krishna uh, through Raj Rishis, but today we see that there are no like Raj Rishi examples and those types of rulers. So is it that the dharma is like corrupted or degraded and it will be re-established again? Is it related to Kalki Avatar? Yeah, it's a not. It's a good point. It's not just Kalki Avatar. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also has come, and in general, it is that. Uh, in kalyuga the individual responsibility becomes much more it's like if the rain is there you cannot stop the rains but that doesn't mean you have to become wet you can get an umbrella and you protect yourself so for us to expect society to change and become more dharmic for the government to be supporting this uh, dharma that can happen but that may not happen soon or that may not happen for long Individual owners, individual responsibility has to be much more than that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
that I will get may be much more severe than somebody else whose skin has never been burnt. Isn't it? So what happens right now? The result, it hasn't come because of present action? Yes, of course. If I had not gone close to fire, I wouldn't have felt the burning sensation. But the amount of burning sensation I have felt, that's not because of my present action. The past action is also there. So there's a, a terrorist may try to set a hundred bombs. Only one explodes. Why? Because it requires past good karma to do present bad karma. <laughs> Not to do it, but to get the result. See, for any why is it that only one terrorist is successful, the other 99 are not? That means that particular terrorist had some good karma by which whatever action they attempted to do in this world would be successful in that particular context. But now they chose to do bad karma. And for that they are responsible. So it's a little, little subtle. See, we, when Krishna says don't be entitled, don't think that you are entitled to result because you understand that my present karma alone is not producing the result. But, but that doesn't mean the present karma doesn't matter. The present karma matters. Because I am choosing to do that. So I'll be held responsible for it. Now, the idea that we should be detached from the results. Detached from the result, detachment, it is not meant to breed irresponsibility. Let me discuss earlier that. It is, it is, what is it meant to do? It is meant to actually help us gain maturity that I should not get too overwhelmed if results don't come out. That in this world is a place of duality. Sometimes I may do a little wrong and I may get a lot of suffering. Sometimes I may do a little good and I may get a lot of good results also. So the idea is that if we are detached, maturity means if the life is such that I may do a little good. It will, so this might be my action. But the reaction might be when I do a little good, I get a little good result. I do a, Sorry, the reaction might be that a little good might give me a great good result. But don't think at this point that, oh, I become also a great person. Or when we do a little bad and we get a terrible result. We think, you know, I'm worthless. No, not necessarily. So it is these dualities, both of these dualities, that we are meant to tolerate. That we have done something. But the reactions we may get in this life are not always proportional to what we have done. So don't get worked up by it. Don't think that life is unfair. 
don't don't think don't become proud thinking we are better than what we actually are so understand that there are other factors in in play also okay. so thank you very much shrimad bhagavad gita ki yeah. shri la prabhupad ki gaur bhakt vrind ki jai thai gaur prema